Hello everyone. Welcome to the course Code Java 101. Today we will be learning Java Virtual Machine. Now this is one of the widely asked topic in Java interviews. The question difficulty ranges from beginner to an expert level. So without further ado, let's start with Java Virtual Machine full guide. Now the very first question which comes to the mind is what is JVM? So JVM is an abstract machine. The main function is to provide an environment where Java bytecode can be executed. Now this virtual machine has to be written in some language. So in which language JVM is written? Now JVM's implementation differs by the provider. For example, the JVM which originally came with Java, which was Sun JVM, at that time it was written in C. The one which most of us uses, which is Oracle JVM, or otherwise known as Hotspot is written in C++. Now there are multiple other JVMs available in the market like Eclipse Open J9 by IBM or Azul Zulu by Azul Systems and many more. So let's take a look at JVM's architecture. Now JVM consists of five parts starting with class loader subsystem, runtime data areas, execution engine, native method interface, and native method library. So this is how JVM architecture looks like. Here, as you can see, there are multiple parts which are interconnected with each other. So we'll be understanding each of them one by one. And to start with, we'll take a look at class loader subsystem. Now class loader subsystem performs three main functions. The first one is loading, then linking, and at last initialization. So this is how a class loader subsystem looks like. So we'll be understanding class loader subsystem with an example. So we have test.class file as an example, which is the input for our JVM. Now this class is provided by the compiler and the entry point of this class is class loader subsystem inside JVM. And inside class loader subsystem, the one which is actually going to kick off the process is loading section which is this one. So loading section is where all the classes will get loaded, which are required for the execution. Now class loader in Java works on three principles. The first one is delegation. In delegation, all the requests will get forwarded to the parent class. And if and only if parent class is not able to load, then only classes will be loaded by the current class loader. Next one is visibility. So as per this principle, child class loader can see all the classes loaded by the parent, but vice versa is not true. Parent class loader can only see the classes which are loaded by the parent. The last one is uniqueness. This principle allows classes to be loaded only once, and this is achieved by delegation. Now, here in this picture, we can see there are three different class loaders. The first class loader that we have is bootstrap class loader. Now this bootstrap class loader is responsible for standard JDK classes from rt.jar folder. And this loader sits on top of the loader hierarchy. The other name of this class is primordial class loader. Next we have extension class loader. Extension class loader delegates all the loading requests to bootstrap. And if bootstrap is unable to load, then only it will load those classes from GRE, lib, ext folder or the directory pointed by java.ext.dirs system property. The third one is application class loader. So application class loader is responsible for application specific classes from class path environment variable. Now extension and application class loader are written in Java by implementing java.lang.classloader and bootstrap or otherwise known as primordial class loader is written in mostly C. So as per the internal working goes, application class loader receives a request to load class, which gets delegated because of delegation principle to the extension class loader which further delegates the request to the bootstrap class loader. 
Now Bootstrap will try to load the requested class and if not found, then it will again delegate the request to extension class loader. Now this time, the request is coming from top. So in this case, extension class loader will try to load the class. And if not found, it will again delegate the request to the application class loader. And application class loader again try to load the class. So this is how the delegation works in class loading system. So whenever or whoever finds the class, the process stops right there. And if all the class loaders were unable to load the classes, then we'll see something familiar, which is either no class def found error or class were found exception. Now the next phase is linking. Now in linking, we have verify, prepare and resolve. So in verify, bytecode verifier will verify the bytecode and if it fails to verify, we'll get verification error. In prepare, memory allocation will happen for all static variables with default values. And in resolve, all the symbolic memory references will be resolved with original references from method area. The last one is initialization. Now in initialization, all the static variables will be assigned with the original values and static block will get executed if any. Now the next section that we have in this JVM is runtime data areas. So runtime data areas are divided into five data areas starting with method area, heap area, stack area, PC registers and native method start. So this is how runtime data areas looks like in the JVM's architecture. So we'll start with method area. Now all the class level data like global variables including static variables will be stored in this space. This area is shared among all the classes and we will only have one method area per JVM. Next we have heap area. Now all the instance variables, arrays and objects will be stored here. Again, this area is also shared space and will only have one heap area per JVM, which means method area and heap area are not thread safe. So in multi-thread environment where multiple threads are accessing the same variable, we won't be able to guarantee the data consistency. The third one that we have is stack area. Now first and the far, foremost important thing in this area is thread safe. And in order to achieve this, for every thread, a separate runtime stack will be created. And all the method details will be stored in stack memory as stack frame. And all local variables will be stored or will be created in stack memory. So for visualization, think of it as a single stack with pile of stack frames stacked on top of each other. So stack frame is divided into three parts. The first one is local variable array. So as name suggests, it will store all the local variables and their values in an array format. Next we have operand stack. Now this will act as a runtime workspace for any intermediate operation that a thread needed to perform. The third one is frame data. Stack frame includes data to support constant pool resolution, normal method return, and exception dispatch. Now this data is stored in frame data. So once the thread completes, all the uh, stack will get destroyed. The next we have is PC registers. Now PC registers holds the address of current executing instruction. And after completion of the instruction, PC register will be updated with the new instruction. And the last one is native method stack. So true to its name, it will hold only native method information. And for every thread, separate native method stack will be created. So third and the fourth one are not participated in object creation. So only method area, heap area and stack area are the areas where objects will be created. So let's take a look at uh, which all areas are thread safe. So method area is not thread safe. 
heap area is not thread safe. The only area which is thread safe is stack area. The next section is execution engine. Now execution engine executes the bytecode assigned to it and it does it by reading the bytecode and executing it by line by line. Now it has three parts. The first one is interpreter, second JIT compiler and the last one is garbage collection. And this is how execution engine looks like in JVM architecture. So interpreter interprets the bytecode and then executes it. The interpretation speed is faster, but execution is slow. The reason behind slow execution is it cannot identify if the same method is already been interpreted, which leads to new interpretation every time. So JIT compiler negates the interpreter issues, which we just saw. So whenever a code comes, which has repeated calls, such code block is allocated to JIT and then JIT compiles the entire block of code into native code. Now this native code is executed directly, thus improving the performance. So JIT compiler consists of four parts. The first one is intermediate code generator. Now as the name suggests, it produces intermediate code. Second, we have code optimizer, which optimizes the code generated by the code generator. Third, target code generator. Now this generates the machine code or native code. And at last we have profiler, which is outside of all these three. And the profiler's job is to keep an eye on the code to find if that particular block of code can be assigned to JIT for the faster execution. The last one is garbage collection. Now garbage collection is a process of cleaning up the memory by removing objects which are not in use or the reference of those objects have been removed. Now this is performed by the garbage collector which is a daemon thread and it runs in the background. So garbage collection is a big topic which we will be covering in unit 2 of this course. The fourth uh, part that we have in JVM is native method interface or Java native interface, JNI, which interacts with native method library and provides required libraries for execution. And the last one is native method libraries. Now native method libraries is a collection of native method libraries required for the execution. Now let's take a look at the interview questions from Java virtual machine. So the first question is, what is JVM? Now this we have already learned. The second one is in which language JVM is written. So we also covered this one. Third one is what is class loader subsystem and how many class loaders do we have in Java? Next one is in which case we receive no class def found error or class not found exception. Fifth one is what is Java bytecode? So Java bytecode is the intermediate language between Java and machine language. So whenever Java code is compiled, it generates .class file which contains bytecode. The next one is difference between JVM, JRE and JDK. So JVM is an abstract machine which executes Java bytecode. JRE or Java Runtime Environment provides an implementation of the JVM and JDK or Java Development Kit consists of JRE and tools such as compiler, debugger, etc. which are required to write Java program. Then what is JIT? Next, explain how Java programs are executed by JVM. And at last, explain working of execution engine. So this is it for this particular tutorial. In the next tutorial, we will learn how to write first Java program. So, thanks for watching.